all get seated. We're going to start now in just a couple minutes. Um, there's some coffee at the back of the room, but if you would... Okay. All right. Uh, good morning. My name is Garth Sheriff, and I am the president of uh, Architects, Designers, Planners for Social Responsibility here in Los Angeles. And I want to welcome you to the first annual uh, Sustainable Materials Conference here at SciArc. Uh, and in saying that, that means that we are hopeful that there will be a second annual conference, and so on. Uh, there was a similar conference to this put on in Boston in October of 1992, some of you may have been involved with. And in talking with the Boston Society of Architects, which is both an ADPSR chapter and an AIA chapter, the only one of its kind in the country, uh, they had done some research on sustainable materials conferences uh, or seminars that were devoted exclusively to that. And they had been, uh, to that date, in October of 1992, the largest in the nation with 80 participants. And so far, when I checked uh, with our committee on Wednesday, we were up to 120. So this gathering will be by far the largest of its kind in the history of the nation. And we intend to make it an institution so that uh, you designers uh, can have it as a resource each year. I'd like to make a brief announcement, and this is in your handout package, that this seminar will be followed by a series of evening lectures uh, beginning in September, October, and November at the Rangers Station Auditorium in Griffith Park. And the two speakers uh, scheduled so far are uh, Dr. Hofu Wu, who is a professor at Cal Poly Pomona, who will talk about evaporative cooling techniques in arid climates, and uh, Martha Eitzen, who is an interior designer uh, from Orange County, who will talk about uh, toxics, indoor air quality, and uh, indoor specifications. And that is in your calendar, so check those dates and please join us then. Um, I'm very happy to be uh, here today and to introduce a couple of people, if you would allow me to. I'd like to introduce and have you give a hand to our honorary chair, uh, Ray Cappy, who was also the founder of Southern California Institute of Architecture. Ray, are you here? And uh, I, won't, I would like to acknowledge every member of the uh, ADPSR Environment Committee who worked tirelessly to help us put this event on. Eve Montana, Pearl Brickman, Scott McGilvery, uh, and especially want to acknowledge, and if I'm forgetting somebody, please forgive me, but I especially want to acknowledge uh, the tireless efforts of David Hertz and our conference chair, Polly Osborne, uh, who I will have the pleasure of introducing in a moment. Um, I'm going to say just a minute on ADPSR itself. Uh, we are the largest 501c3 nonprofit group of designers in the nation, about 3,000 strong, with 14 chapters. Uh, despite that impressive sounding statistic, it is a struggle, a constant struggle, to put on events in Los Angeles because we are always working as a nonprofit from a very small funding base. So if you have become a part of this conference and you appreciate the work that ADPSR is doing, a membership in ADPSR is $30, which includes all of our newsletters, uh, invitations to all of our events, and will include a very special invitation in August to an evening with Ricardo Legaretta at the Greenberg residence. He is a member of our board of advisors and that is his best known residential work in Los Angeles. And that will be... Uh, a members only evening in August and I hope that uh, everybody will consider signing up with ADPSR and will come to that event and others. Um, before I turn it over to Polly Osborne I'd, I'd like to just read a short uh, message that I have here. It's addressed to Garth Sheriff, President LA Chapter. Dear Garth, 
<clears throat> congratulations to you and to the ADPSR LA on the first annual conference on sustainable materials in Los Angeles on May 1st, 1993. As a member of Congress dedicated to the development of an environmentally clean technology industry here in Los Angeles, I applaud the efforts of ADPSR in holding a conference that will feature hands-on, forward-thinking seminars about green building technology. This conference on sustainable materials will very likely be looked upon by architects, designers, and planners as a watershed event in their respective professions. Dedication to sustainable materials is crucial if we are to live without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs. Energy efficient buildings will help stop the exploitation of our natural resources and will go a long way towards reducing energy costs. Planning developments with environmentally sustainable design in mind will help preserve open space and wildlife habitat for future generations to enjoy. ADPSR will undoubtedly be a leader as our nation enters the 21st century. Please keep up the good work. Our earth is depending on you. And it's signed regards, Jane Harmon, who is the congressperson from this district. Uh, so with that, I would uh, take great pleasure in introducing our chair for this event, the person most responsible for this coming into being. And she will introduce our keynote speaker. It is my great pleasure to introduce Polly Osborne. Okay. Any speakers who haven't given us their slides, Flora over there, who's raising her hand, uh, will take them upstairs for you. Sustainable building is only possible if we have a sustainable society. And I guess we're a start of that because if you're here, I don't have to convince you that we have to understand we can no longer liquidate our natural resources. We're not here to convince you, but to try to help you start doing it, to show you how and to tell you who is doing it so that you can grill them with your questions. Uh, in the morning, you'll meet the speakers. They each have a rather short time to talk to you, only 10 minutes. So um, it's not, probably won't be a time to ask too many questions unless they give you part of their 10 minutes. Uh, but in the afternoon, we're going to have round tables. We're going to rearrange the room so that these tables here will have speakers behind them and they'll be in far corners of the room and you can go to the speakers that you need to get the most information from and talk to them personally and ask lots of questions. Uh, uh, in the afternoon, we'll, we'll change those group. We'll ring a bell every half hour so you can switch groups and so that there won't be too much wandering back and forth uh, between tables in the middle of that. Uh, some changes, William Smart will be speaking for Chet Chaffee. William Smart also is part of uh, the certification systems. Uh, uh, at the round tables, Martha Eitzen will replace Audrey Hoodkus in the afternoon, also uh, an interior designer dealing with non-toxics. Audrey couldn't attend today because she uh, she is a living example of this uh, chemical-laden world in that she was poisoned by pesticides, and that's what started her career. However, it also started a lawsuit uh, that she was able finally to get some depositions for today, so we're sorry that she couldn't come. Uh, and uh, also, Douglas Gardner will not be on the round tables in the afternoon. Uh, I would also like to thank Claude Myers very much for dealing with registration and Rosemary Rabin for being our spiritual guiding force. Uh, John Picard is our, our keynote speaker. I think that um, uh, when I first heard John speak, it made me able to uh, have the impetus to go to the phone and call up the contractor I was working with and tell him that things were going to be a little different now. And uh, the same thing to my structural engineer, because uh, John makes it sound like we can do it. 
and it's not an unattainable goal. So, John. Hi. My own personal mic adjuster. Um, I'm John Picard. I, I see some familiar faces here today, but for those of you who don't know who I am, I'm, uh, I'm not an architect. I'm just somebody who got tired of building big estates and wasting electricity and wasting water and working for people who really didn't have the uh, insight that we all have. But now I'm here to move people and I am here to convince you. I don't think that everybody is as convinced as I'd like to see them be convinced. I've been in City Hall, I've been in the White House recently, I've been up and down the state, I've been in Canada, I've been speaking to builders all across the country. I've seen the market changing recently from wood going to recycled steel, basically driven by price change. I've seen a lot of things happening. But what I don't see is I don't see people doing things for what I think is the right reason. We should be designing and building sustainably because in our heart it's what we need to do and it's what we should do. And it's not that all the recycled materials and, and all of the things that we can work with, with low toxics and recycled content, aren't gonna help us get to a more sustainable life. I think that's more of a survival life. But we as people who build, and, and you as designers and architects, there's a, I think, a rebirth of this industry and a, and a rebirth of what the the market is going to be and I think people are going to be asking for different things. They're going to be asking for lower toxic houses. They're going to be asking for more energy efficiency. And I think it's opening up a whole new market in an industry that's really been hurt by the economy. And when I've been around the country in the last few months speaking and listening to people shifting gears trying to find something else to do because their current business has failed, I've noticed a lot of people taking a liking to this, you know, kind of green eco movement because it's new and, and it's pioneering. I've been a part of the AIA conferences that have been broadcast for the last few months and the last one was on sustainable development and I, and I picked up a lot of good ideas from that and I'm going to share with you the 12 points that I picked up there. I have a difficult time speaking for 10 minutes. Anybody that knows me knows that I could go on all day. I'm going to hang around for the round tables and I really wish people would ask questions and get involved. Um, I've made a lot of mistakes on my project. My house is a classic. I've, since I've met Julie and a lot of people I've worked with, when people come to my house for a tour, I, I call the tour the 33 things not to do when you're doing an environmental project. And uh, I've learned from my mistakes. I've learned well enough to acquire a large contract with Sony Pictures and to build a company that's got 10, 12 people working all the time in two years. We now work at Warner Brothers, we work at Paramount. I've signed a job with a $150 million project in Canada, which I'm telling you is the most exciting thing I've ever done. The owner's my age and he's personally financing this project and we're going to do some amazing things. I mean, fuel cells and, and heat sinks in the bay and things like that are just the beginning. The material sourcing and all the wonderful concepts of using computers to maximize efficiency in the designs and not just take the straight course of construction has really got me excited and so I feel like I've moved myself to another generation so I can come back here next year and talk about that as well. But just a couple of years ago I built a house out of recycled steel that I didn't even know it was recycled when it had hit the deck on my lot. I didn't know what toxic paint was, I didn't know what VOCs were, I didn't know what you know, a, a solvent was and what it did and what, it, what a boiling point is and what a vapor factor was. I didn't know about crop woods. I didn't know about gray water. I didn't know how important it was. But I started to learn that here we are, people who pipe fresh water in, we never collect the rainwater, we run it off and pollute the bay. And how ridiculous that is. And I start meeting people like you guys who have the answers and engineers who want to do it. But the thing that's really a problem in this city is the city. It's chaos downtown. The zoning's wrong. The building code's wrong. And we've got to do something about that. We, we, we can talk recycled products. We can talk energy efficiency. We can do all that stuff. It's doable. Some people don't believe it. Well, there's, there's projects coming up along the line that are going to prove it. One of the biggest projects in the city is across the street. And I've carefully reviewed the project for the last couple of months. And I think it's one of the most positive 
projects that could ever hit the deck in LA and a fulcrum of change that you know nobody could even reckon with and yet it goes through these hoops and, and, and problems of review because the city is designed not to allow sustainable development to happen. It's not designed to let natural runoff happen. It's not designed to incorporate gray water systems and reclaimed water the way we should. It's not designed to, to traffic and create transit oriented areas the way we need to have it. This city is a monument on what not to do. And the few projects that are coming up now with the kind of people involved in the projects like you, myself, and a lot of other people, the hurdle is the inertia of this city. And we have to start changing it politically. We need sustainable politics to happen. And that's got to happen soon. And I'm preaching to the choir to talk about detail. And I, and I focus today about what I, what I really think is important, is that we all need to become more active politically. We need to become a team instead of this linear kind of single issue broken up group. We need to go in as a team with a focused mission of going into city council, of going into the planning commission, and going into the mayor's office and create an environmental zoning code parallel to the existing zoning code. We need to create an environmental building code that parallels the existing building code because we'll never change the zoning and we'll never change the existing code, not to enhance the entire city. And I think things are going to have to happen on a volunteer basis. I think projects are going to come up like the, the project that um, you know, NRDC is working on with DWP. I can't think of the fellow's name now. He's recycled a big building in mid Wilshire and they've got a fuel cell going in and it's, incre it's an incredible project. And I've been lucky to work on kind of the non-city things like Sony and, and the studios because they're like a city within a city. That's like working at UCLA where there's no building code and they don't need to get permits and all that. You can get away with murder. Well, we're not getting away with murder, but we're getting away with doing things that we really can't do on the outside of the city wall. And there's some people here from Gensler today that can tell you there's been a big shift in the way things are being done. And the dimension of change has to happen at that city level for all of these products to work, for all of our ideas to work. We've primed the pump for change by bringing recycled drywall and recycled steel and insulation and low toxic materials to the, to the marketplace. Super windows, reflective roofs, you know, sophisticated solar orientation systems and, and looking at daylighting and looking at those natural no cost and low cost approach to building. But what we haven't done is we haven't gone out and built the bridges with the infrastructure that's going to support us. In fact, we've alienated ourselves from that city. They, they, you know, I, I'm all too often categorized as having done something radical. It's not going to be effective. It's not going to meet what the masses' needs are. Well, if that's the case and we keep breaking natural law the way we do, the way we pollute land, the way we pollute the water, the way we build like there's a never-ending source of supply and material, and we start looking at recycled materials as something as a secondary use material or as an alternate and not as a first choice. I'm here to tell you that breaking natural law at the rate we are when we're 5.5 billion tenants on this planet with an increase that's going to double very shortly and a decreasing curve of material supply, we're going to die. And there's no judge, no doctor, no anybody's going to get you out of breaking natural law. And we are the people of creation and change. We are the ones who can stop that. We are the ones who can move one of the worst designed cities in a city plagued with problems, social problems, crime ridden. We can turn it around. We can turn it around by greening our streets, by greening the designs of our buildings. And when I say green, I don't mean green the way a lot of people view it. They, they take this perspective as though, you know, we're going to have agriculture and grow our food on the land. Well, maybe we should, but at least we should start somewhere by stopping the sprawl outbound, start building more clustered, higher density, smarter developed projects. Like Playa, you need to look at the models of some of the projects that are on, on the plan right now. They're, they're, they're worth looking at. They've had some of the best experts in the country. And, and I'm, I'm going to fight for that project because it's one of the few projects that's going to demonstrate the kind of things that we all work towards. In a, in a society that takes the way we take, but we're a society that has got to start realizing it's not what we take, but what we leave behind. It's not a value-added situation. It's a value-retained situation. 
You know, we're, we're, we're really powerful right now. We're an idea that's come to its time, and we need to start enforcing our power. And we have to start going to the people who are in power and educating them instead of alienating them. My work with a lot of environmental groups, their prime problem is they alienate. They don't infiltrate and educate. It's a major mistake. We need to start doing more of that. You know, there's no, there's no more competitiveness. We don't have time for that. We can't compete anymore. We have to team up. We can't think and plan and build linear anymore. We have to get cyclical. We have to create a sphere of team. We have to work. The structural engineer has to work with the mechanical engineer. He has to talk to the architect. You have to impose what you want in the design. You have to talk through these materials. You have to beg them to cooperate. And I'm here to tell you, when you do that, and I do that because I fight hard for those relationships, one of the things I do best is put people together and sell them on the idea of this 12-point approach to a project instead of my approach and his approach. For us to pull this sustainable thing off, this, this we, us stuff has to happen and the I, me, mine stuff has to drop. I know like I'm talking psychosurgery on you, but it's the beginning. It's how I survived those meetings where clients say, I'm not going to pay an extra 7 or 8 or 9 percent. I'm a first cost, bottom line guy. And I blow those guys away because I come in and I put a building together with a team approach that is so efficient that it reduced the first cost of their mechanical equipment and more often than not it paid for all the things that we talked about. Now that's my thunder and you should be out doing it and everything I know and everything I've got I'm willing to share with you. I've toured thousands of people through my house. I've had no private life for three years. I probably will never have a private life. Um, you know, I think Kennedy had a premonition when he said, it's not what your country can do for you, but it's what you should do for your country. I think he knew Bush was coming in. I, I think he knew we were going to have a Reagan era. I think he knew that. And, you know, I'm a little worried about what's going on with Clinton right now. But I'm not going to worry. I'm not going to get bummed out and talk about it. I'm going to do something about it. I grabbed him off the stairs at the Forest Conference and said, hey, this is not a country that just builds with lumber. Don't listen to these guys. There's recycled steel. The lumber industry is proof that it's changing. They're running so scared that they're developing all these composite wood materials, all this Louisiana Pacific stuff you see. These guys are one of the worst polluters in the country. But I use their products, and I'm going to use them. I'm going to use anything that works because I'm looking at the whole. And the environmental groups look at me and say, how can you work with DuPont? I said, well, who else is going to come up with a no CFC solution that drops in all the existing air conditioning equipment? It's not that we need to replace all the air conditioners. We need to replace the refrigerant. We need to leave the air conditioners because the bottom line owner is not going to spend the nickel. You guys know it, and I know it. So we have to find solutions that work. And the first place I think we need to focus, and the point that I wanted to make most clearly today, is that we need to become active in this city more politically. And I'm going to make it my mission in life to continue the work that I'm doing. But I'm going to focus this year in a couple areas. And specifically, I'm getting in the face. I've had meetings with the Environmental Affairs Department. I'm doing a pro bono project with Mark Ridley Thomas on the mini city hall, which was burned after the fires. And I've spent a tremendous amount of time introducing a lot of these products. But I've also spent a lot of time introducing what a force to be reckoned with that we are and what sustainable development is. It's survival. And this city is perfect to start it in. Not Seattle, not Canada, not Hawaii, not anywhere. This city is a prime place for change. I mean, we desperately need it. And I think we will build our businesses and we'll increase our market shares. And I think you're going to make a lot more money. And I think the diversification to this kind of work is going to be very profitable. I want to cover those points real quickly because I know I'm running out of time. So when I get to a point, Polly, when I'm out of time, throw something at me. Um, the first things I, I really liked about the AA conference was it was like a, everyone was complaining it was like a giant infomercial and, and um, I didn't think so. I thought there was a good group of people. But out of it, I'm going to cover these real quickly. One of the things that they said was we need to design with an expanded understanding of agriculture and nature. A key factor was this, this guy said, he said, you know, in nature there is no waste. Boy, that has stuck with me. That, that's going to be part of the my programming to think about how I can limit the amount of trash containers leaving my site and how I can keep things from not being waste from the point that they come in. We also need to learn to say no to some projects. What a great city to do the ultimate recycling game. 
we need to recycle some of these buildings that we already have. As architects and designers, you need to walk up and say, I don't think you should build that. That's wrong. You shouldn't touch that piece of dirt. You don't have the right to carve that hillside. Over here, actually, is a, is a, is a building that has embodied energy in it. They already put the foundation in, all the infrastructure's there. Let's look at gutting the thing 98.6% of the way and revamping it to what you want. And let's look at the attributes of recycling buildings within this city. The design needs to be more of a nonlinear and more of a cyclical approach, which I mentioned. We have to get off this single issue specialization stuff. I see people, the, the NIMBYs and the cave people. You know what a cave person is? It's a citizen against virtually everything. I know environmental groups who are out against wind generating plants and they're out against some very positive situations that are going to help our environment just because they're against stuff. We need to be a team so that we can respond to these kinds of things. We've been in a product age, we've been in a service age and now we're in an information age and we're in a need for more information and change and we don't have it. That's why the education process needs to take place. That's why you guys, ADPSR is so important. That's why Echo Home is so important. That's why getting involved with the community and getting involved with projects that are large and displaced and some people are on it and some people are off it, you've got to get involved and see what's good in them and actually go to those people. Developers and everybody I've noticed recently has got open ears. People are very opened up right now. In, a time, in the 60s and the 70s, it, di it just didn't seem to be that way to me. In the 80s, it was just make big money. And now, everybody's kind of looking around, lost, saying, well, maybe I should listen to this guy. So there's an opportunity there that we need to look at. We need to harvest our talent and our products locally as well. I think a big success would be if we help stimulate Rebuild LA, too, because they're not doing it. We need to get businesses down into Rebuild LA area that produce these products. Things like Syndicrete. You know, David's busted his butt to put that business together. And I'm going to help him by pushing his products onto large contract situations like The Gap that build 150 stores a year, 1,200 construction projects. And these guys are sensitized. These CEOs are movable. Before they weren't, because they weren't going to spend 1% or 2% of their capital base to make their company more environmentally friendly. Well, right now, they're looking back at GM. They're looking back at the airlines. They're looking back at Sears and Roebuck, and they're saying, oh, shit, we better really get it together. And so there's a time and an opportunity now to do that kind of stuff. And the leading companies, if you look around, aren't just the greenwashers. They're taking leading positions like Sony Pictures, like The Gap. And these guys know they've got huge problems. The chairman of The Gap says to me, you know, we're in big trouble. We're, we're, we sell cotton shirts. I mean, everybody in the environment knows that cotton's like the next big target. What can we do? So last week I got a shirt, a t-shirt made from 100% recycled PET. Feels like prima cotton. And it's not that the shirt was made from something recycled, but the shirt's going to recycle again. And it's working with existing things and pushing them along. Like my car, I have one of the worst cars in the world. It's a Range Rover, 12 miles per gallon. But I'm taking stuff that's here today and making it the best it can. So when you go out in the parking lot, you're going to see a technical dual fuel CNG car with the first filling station ever put in in a residence, a no CFC air conditioning system, reclaimed oil, the carpets made out of recycled PET, a solar system that comes on when the interior temperature gets over 80 degrees. I mean, all kinds of stuff with an existing car that should be a boat anchor, basically because it got 12 miles per gallon and it pollutes and pollutes and pollutes. But I want that car and I'm going to drive that car to my house in Mexico because it's what I want to do. And that's what the population says to me too. I get into these jobs, I get in early, I have a lot of effect. I get in midway, I have limited effect. I get in at the end, I basically say it's too late. But you can do this paint, you can do this. But when you informationalize early and you educate early, your curve of operation is going to be much greater. People will really receive, you've got to educate them to the environmental impacts. You've got to tell them how we're evaporating our coal mines into the air to, to provide for our voracious en energy appetite. You've got to tell them about clear cutting. You've got to tell them about people like Skyhawks that will fly you over and show you clear cut firsthand. You've got to weaken them at the knees. You know, because we, we're harvesting at an unsustainable rate to meet the demand. And we're involved in the end product of housing. And the National Association of Home Builders and all these organizations, organizations that build these, these demonstration projects, we need to support that. We need to get more involved. We need to design and build as there is, we, we have been designing and building as though there is a never ending supply of Earth's resources. We have been and still are tampering with nature. 
and we've got to continue to move towards a difference in, in, in affecting that. I'm working off of a, a fairly large speech format, and I want to jump to the end because my time's up, and I'm getting the big cutoff session here. But um, I want to close with a couple of real quick points. I've been seeing a, an amazing thing that when people are leading, it seems like this government's following. I had the unique opportunity of going to Washington a couple weeks ago and doing a mini eco audit on the White House in the old executive office building. And uh, real quick, I'll tell you, it's the easiest job I'll ever do. I walked into the men's room and I look up and there's an air conditioner on, an open window, and the radiator's on at the same time. And I saw one of the staffers go down the hall about a half a mile to print a, print a copy of something off disk because they had like one printer on the floor. And as this usher's walking us through, he's pointing out how it's such historic value in the whole place. And I looked up and I see two three-inch galvanized pipe electrical conduits and distribution box face nailed onto the most beautiful hand-carved crown molding you've ever seen. And I'm thinking, well, there's a, there's a chance for me here because some powerhouse got in here and got that in. And I'm going to get back in here, get it out, and get the right stuff into this project. Um, Quickly, we all know that we need to be working with the utilities. One of the keys to success for me is grabbing that money, that incremental savings money that the utilities will put on the table to help us put forward these high performance buildings. Without it, we won't survive. We need to support that relationship. We need to make sure that we're at the public utility hearings. We need to make sure the gas company survives, that Edison survives, that DWP survives. And you have to engage them early on, too. There's technical assistance there and a lot of money and a lot of good ideas. We don't know it all. And they've, they've got the money to do the research to bring those new technologies forward. So work with them. They're also doing a tremendous amount in the communities. Even though we kind of make the assumption that they're the bad guys, but you know, we're the ones that put them there. We're the ones that let them build the $6 billion nuclear power plant. And we're the ones going out and buying the 100-watt light bulb that burns the electricity. And we promote that Polaroid principle of let's give them the camera and screw them on the film. It's time to turn that around. It's time to convince people that compact fluorescents are a real thing to deal with and that all the energy envelope features are a real thing to deal with. So when you get to your next project, know as much as you can about everything in that next room. Know as much as you can about everybody else's ideas of design. Try to commingle your ideas. Do what you know you know you're supposed to be doing. Work your designs from the heart and think long term. Incorporate species extinction into your design. Incorporate resource reduction into your design. You know, we're moving the studio single-handedly off of tropical hardwoods in Luwan because we told CEOs of companies that advanced teams go in and mow down whole families of orangutans in Sarawak and Borneo. And I asked the CEO, I said, what do you think? They packed their suitcase and moved to the other side of the island while we came in and cut it down? He said, no, it never occurred to me. He says, right now, we're going to stop. And so I'm going to stop with that. I'm really happy to be here. Like I said, it's public domain, everything I've learned, all the mistakes I've made, and all the experiences I've had. I'm willing to share them with you singularly or in a group. More than welcome to come kick the tires at my house. And my phone's always getting answered. So thanks for having me today. Okay, so uh, what is an environmental product? Um, that's a really good question, and um, it takes a lot of work to define the answer. So we have William Smart here, who is currently developing a new certification system for the environmental claims of manufacturers. And uh, so he can give us the criteria for what is environmental. Bill? Where is Bill? Okay. I have slides up there. Right. Hi, my company is called Scientific Certification Systems. We got started in 1984 uh, evaluating uh, produce for pesticide residues, and that business is still in place. It established a lot of relationships with retailers. And in the late 80s, as environmental marketing claims started to uh, exponentially increase uh, on products, um, this, those same retailers asked us to try to develop certification programs and hire the expertise to evaluate things like recycled content. Are there slides?
Thank you. Um, claims like recycle content, biodegradability, that's not mine. Um, it's a gray carousel with a black top and maybe about too many slides on it. I'm sorry. I'm, thank you. Okay. So in the last uh, three years, this April, so three years now, we've been, uh, we had a program that evaluates recycle content claims, energy efficiency claims, biodegradability claims, VOC content claims on single products. And this is a labeling program, if you will, like a good housekeeping seal, except a little bit different. We'll talk about that. Next slide, please. Uh, these are some of the uh, concerns that humans have uh, about uh, environmental factors that influence their buying behavior. Next slide, please. I'm going to move through these very quickly. Um, here are some claims, and usually a claim pertains to some problem that people perceive as a problem in, in uh, society. Next slide, please. Um, here's a bevy of claims. Next slide, please. And here's some more. And uh, that's about a third of what we found in the marketplace. Next, please. Um, our goal in helping these retailers um, evaluate claims was twofold. One, to remove bad claims in the marketplace. And secondly, to develop accurate claims and get the word out on those products. Next slide, please. Uh, you might think that this is a role the government should play, and in fact they do play it, though uh, not very well, and perhaps that's, perhaps that's a function of the administration. I think it's a function of uh, uh, unwillingness to make a decision. Um, that's my experience with the government. EPA um, and the FTC, FTC is very competent, though they don't have the manpower. Uh, attorneys General, uh, several states, I think 14 states, put together a report providing guidelines on how to make environmental claims. Um, for example, things like environmentally friendly you should not use because it's too general. It's better to be specific about what the exact product attribute is. It's so great. Next slide, please. Uh, so these were some of the guidelines from the FTC. Next slide, please. Um, so we developed with retailers initially, and now it's gone to uh, government programs as well. Um, a means of conducting third-party certifications, verifications of claims in the marketplace. And we've hired industrial process engineers that are familiar with reprocessing uh, recycled materials, for example. And uh, next slide, please. Uh, we have a couple of different programs. One's called Claims Screening, and that's strictly looking at something and kind of rendering a legal opinion, if you will. Are the claims that are made on this product sold at the Home Depot going to uh, pose problems in light of what the FTC guidelines are or what, st or what an individual state says. The second thing is a claims certification program, and that's if it's an outstanding claim or if it's a significant claim in the marketplace. We have uh, a labeling program for it to help it get recognition. Third category I'll spend some time on today is life cycle inventory. That's adding up all the environmental burdens, not just focusing on one thing, which we tend to do, like recycled content. Uh, you know, we're thinking about landfill diversion there. In uh, life cycle, you're actually trying to uh, look at everything from cradle to grave. And I'm also going to talk a little bit about a forest conservation program. We have another new program up that's not up there called the PACE program, which is a program that works with governments. Uh, 35 states in the United States uh, have procurement policies to purchase recycled materials or products made from recycled materials when possible, and they actually pay a preference in most of those states. And um, that program is designed to help procurement officers um, verify that they get what they pay for. Next slide, please. Um, this is how this, the uh, evaluation, the screening goes. The retailer says they want to have screening. They send a letter to the vendor. The vendor replies. We review the uh, thing and generate a report that goes to both parties. And uh, the vendor then tries to clean up their labeling if necessary. Next slide, please. And we can counsel them on how to do that responsibly. Um, our program, you'll see, is not just a seal of approval, or like a good housekeeping seal. It doesn't really tell you anything. You just see it there and get a warm feeling. Um, it's a product information label. Next slide, please. And we thought a lot about why we wanted to do it that way. The first thing we started doing was looking at single attributes. 
Next slide, please. And uh, the verification process was similar. We would review information. Let's say it's recycled content. The manufacturer would send us information why they claim that it has so much post-consumer and so much pre-consumer material. We would uh, review the materials, um, then go on to their manufacturing facility and walk through their facility. We'd sign non-disclosure forms, confidentiality agreements, et cetera, and then uh, uh, conduct paper audits, if you will, of what their purchase records were, if it was purchasing post-consumer materials, testing if necessary, as in the case of biodegradability or VOC content. And uh, then we compare the findings to the database to make sure it's a significant claim in the marketplace. And uh, then after the person's certified, we continue to review that claim over time, especially in the case of recycled content where you look, have to monitor that material flowing through the facility to make sure they maintain that recycled content level. Next slide, please. Here are some single claims recycled content. We always break it out post and pre per the government requirements. Um, biodegradability, we indicate what that means. You only find that on soaps, detergents, and cleansers. No solid materials are legally allowed to be called biodegradable. Um, Hefty paid a lot of money for that. And the smog producing ingredients, VOCs, we actually don't just look at smog producing when we certify. We also look at the ozone depleters, which the EPA does not. EPA's definition of VOCs lets you include ozone depleters in your products. Next slide, please. You notice, by the way, that there is no energy efficiency claim up there. We were under contract about two years ago to, uh, with a, and actually in it, over this two-year period, with a major, one of the big three lighting companies. And uh, we have not certified anybody on energy efficiency claims for compact fluorescents because they're not as efficient as they claim to be. And people are beginning to realize that the claims like save 70% energy, that's what you typically find on a CFL, is patently false. And um, as I can talk with you more about that later this afternoon, but um, we've done a lot of research on that. And it's really too bad because it would be wonderful to certify environmental uh, energy efficiency claims because not only does the consumer get to be good, but they also get to save money. Um, but uh, there are several problems with that technology, some of which are getting resolved in the near future, but it's still going to be... Uh, rather than about three and a half times more efficient, it's probably going to be more in the neighborhood of two to three times. And it depends on how you use it. Next, oh, what do we have? Well, that's fine. Um, PACE program. I want to tell you a little bit about PACE. PACE is a government program. It's also um, something that will work well for, for uh, uh, large corporations. Where you're buying a lot of product, the idea is that as part of your bid submittal, the bidder will submit a report from a third party organization. Right now it's just a scout's honor type of thing. Oh yeah, I'm putting 50% recycled content in there. And, uh, and then the state will pay 5% in California, 15% in New, uh, New Jersey, for example. But there's no verification of that. It's just a scout's honor signing an affidavit type of thing. And if you look at most recycled paper guides, the people that generate those guides have no idea what's really happening at the manufacturing facility. And we're different in that we're actually going there and looking at their operation. Um, notice that the problem is that these states pay a preference but they don't have the, the technical expertise or the resources to go and do verification. They may put fr a fraud, raw, law will bring you in for fraud or something, but most of the time it's misrepresentation, not fraud, and misrepresentation isn't an actionable offense in a lot of places. So uh, there's a problem in being able to enforce it. Um, there's no mechanism for recognizing bidders. Right now in the state of California, we say paper products, all of them, and 50% recycled, 40% pre, 10% post. Um, the problem with that is that paper towels, most tissue products, for example, 100% recycled content is quite easy and has been for a while. Um, but um, with uh, um, fine writing paper and things like that, 50% recycled content is fairly difficult. So what you need to do is make the policy more product specific. So when you're paying that preference, you're uh, actually encouraging industry to move forward. So we're trying to develop this program so that we can develop uh, product specific policy. Next slide, please. And um, for the state of California, we're launching this uh, next month or in a month from now it's going out. And uh, we're looking at more than just the recycled content factor. We're going to verify virgin, pre, post, and shrinkage percentage. Um, 
which pertains to clay content and things like that. And also we're going to look at how much process energy was used to make one bid versus another bid, how much water was used to make one bid versus another bid, and what the transportation burden is to get it from the mill to the client. Next slide, please. And they're going to develop a, a dollar saving credit method to do that. It's actually developed. Win-win uh, program, blah, blah, blah. Um, lots of benefit statements. Am I at two minutes? I'm out. OK. Well, I'll tell you about life cycle in the afternoon session. Thanks. I'll say, I'll say one more thing. Our claim, our, our product, here's something I was at a huge market. We don't have that in Northern California, but here's a typical claim, uh, an emblem on the side that shows that we've certified the recycled content of that paper bag. And here's a fiberglass product by Manville, the people that were the, our, our friends in asbestos that have now made incredibly clean facilities. And this is a, the bag for a uh, insulation in, uh, on, in your walls. And uh, we certified their nationwide production uh, at 20% uh, post, 15% post-consumer, 5% pre-consumer uh, glass. And that's really quite an accomplishment. Owens Corning isn't close. Thank you. Remember the Academy Awards, where they just cut everyone off? We're going to be ruthless here because we have so many speakers. Uh, so speakers watch me when I go like that. That means two minutes. Um, our next speaker is Jim Bell. Uh, he will discuss the economics of sustainability. Jim? Boy, I really feel for all the speakers, you know, they all have so much to offer, so I hope everybody stays for the roundtables. Uh, basically, what I do is I'm an ecological designer, it's a field I've been pioneering for a number of years, and uh, what I basically do is work with clients to help them do whatever they're trying to do in ways that are as ecologically sustainable and economically viable as possible. Uh, we have a problem, though, because uh, right now all of us that live in the world are actually subsidizing the very products and practices that are causing the problem. And this certification process is excellent because that's, that's the beginning process of getting all those costs on the table. And if I was President Clinton, I think one of the first things I'd do is get the General Accounting Office and uh, some of the better accounting firms busy working with uh, uh, certification programs to uh, to find out what things really cost and then make sure that those costs were included in the price of the product or service that's involved. That gets the free market system working to clean up the environment, which we, we certainly need. So right now you can plan a perfect project and then you have to back away from what really makes ecological sense uh, to get practical given the, the present economic situation. And that's, that's kind of a burden toward some of the things that we want to do. I want to talk briefly about uh, this report that I have a few copies here available if people want to, are interested in getting one. I was hired by the County of San Diego and the City of Chula Vista to analyze uh, the Otay Ranch project, which is a 23,000 acre project. And I looked at it from the perspective that if you were going to build such a thing, how could you do it in a way that would be both ecologically sustainable and economically viable? And I think I made a pretty good case that not only could you do that, you could actually improve the economic performance by doing what made sense ecologically. Uh, I want to show a few slides which kind of get into that whole concept of watershed, which was mentioned in the introductory letter that was read, and, and this, this whole idea of, of, of sort of the crux of my work beyond what I said before is two, really answering two basic questions. How can how can we decide where it's appropriate to do what on the planet? And then secondly, once we've got the right location, how do we do the what in a way that's as ecologically and economically sustainable as possible? So uh, can we put that uh, first slide? You've all seen this. This is sort of my gauge, and, and I won't talk about the criterion since other people have covered that. But we have to ask questions when we look at technologies like, well, if this is such a good technology, what's the impact if two billion people do it? Uh, because that's really the game we're playing. We have to look at the total system function uh, from the perspective of, of how uh, all the, when you add up all the impacts, is it really sustainable? 
Next slide, please. Now, if we look at the whole planet, that's kind of a big uh, honk to deal with. So what I do is break that down into watersheds. And this shows all the watershed boundaries in, this, in the San Diego Tijuana region. And uh, the, the water is basically flows either in the Pacific Ocean or to the desert or in between basins. And this is the planning unit that I think we need to really focus on. And we, we of course, have to acknowledge political boundaries, but this is really the bottom line in terms of ecological planning. Next slide, please. This slide shows uh, geology in the San Diego part of the region, and the, the yellow areas you see there represent where all the groundwater is stored. So that's a, a good place not to build because you don't want to block groundwater recharge. Next slide. This one shows earthquake uh, susceptibility also, which turns out some of the worst places are where groundwater is stored. It's subject to a phenomenon called liquefaction. Next slide. This shows the floodplains. Once again, it also roughly corresponds to groundwater and alluvial deposits. Uh, not a good place to, to build. And you can sort of see, when you begin to look at park systems and wildlife corridors, you could follow the dark areas, which are the floodplains, and have a wildlife corridor and park that went from the ocean to the, to the mountains. And then you can join the finger canyons across mesas and hillsides to have a north-south uh, north movement of animals. And these are places that we could all bicycle and hike and camp and uh, horseback ride and so forth. All would be consistent with maintaining uh, wildlife habitats and uh, and, uh, and basically the watershed function, which which uh, not only is self-perpetuating but helps us in a lot of ways because it it protects us from soil erosion and flooding and and uh, and so forth. So there's a lot of reason to maintain those uh, areas. Next slide. Uh, this shows soils. It's one of the smaller basins in the region. There's 74 different soil types shown here out of 124 in our region. Next slide. This shows only the agricultural soils. Right now on our planet, there's 5.5 billion of us and only about 4 billion acres of, of soil of this quality on the whole planet. Makes sense to protect that, and this becomes also part of the park system, and a lot of this does correspond with alluvial deposit and so forth. So there's a, basically the idea here is by, by making transparent overlays of all these maps, you can see all the different resources and hazards in, in relationship, and by using this as a resource, you can tell very easily where it's appropriate to have the most intense human activity. Uh, and, and you can use it two ways, both in new projects and in existing projects. As uh, was mentioned earlier, uh, say like redoing LA as you have blighted areas that are wearing out, instead of rebuilding there, you might decide not to rebuild there, reclaim the resource that, that, that was there before, and move that, that activity to a more desirable location. If you're going to use soils for human uh, in, uh, activity, use the, the least valuable soils first. Uh, next slide. Uh, and this just shows some of the maps going down into Tijuana. We're, this project is in progress right now. Could you skip all the way to the back, uh, the last five slides? I want to talk a little bit about a couple of uh, other projects. One of the things that was brought up before was education. and. Uh, I know we have this nice facility here, but I was sort of thinking it doesn't look like it's very ecologically designed, which would have been really nice when it was put together. Maybe some improvements could be made. Uh, go back one more. Uh, this is what I call a peace ecology university, and the idea is to set up educational institutions, either new ones or existing ones, uh, to basically teach people how to live and make a living in ways that are ecologically sustainable and in ways that promote world peace. And, and the idea is that the universities would be examples of what they teach. Next slide. This is sort of nighttime when we're having a party. It's important to party a lot when you're doing all this stuff because you, you get burned out if you don't, so that's one of my themes. Next slide. And then when I'm looking at a project, one of the first, my major concern is watershed function. If you're going to change the watershed, let's make sure it really works well to protect the water so you can collect that water and reuse it. In this case, Underneath the solar furnace would be a large water tank to, to be used by the school, and then once the water was used, it would be recycled and used for irrigation. One of my projects is an experimental water recycling plant down in Tijuana, and, and it's designed to recycle all the water and all the nutrients so nothing goes in the ocean. I don't know if you ever realize this, but sewage systems are actually forms of erosion, the way they're, the way they're practiced right now. Uh, and then, you know, basically, you still have cars. There's underground parking. 
Uh, and, but, but the school itself is actually designed to do all the things that we would like to see done in the bigger society and also train people how to set up businesses and, and uh, sell the new skills that we're all developing here so, so that we can get out into the marketplace and, and know how to do it. Uh, next slide. This, oh, this is the Mutant Ninja Cats. <laughs> next slide. Okay, this is uh, one of my clients, uh, Deanza Group, which actually is headquartered up in Beverly Hills. They have about 30 different camping, golf course, uh, mobile home park areas around the country. Been working with them for about uh, three years now. And we've eliminated the use of pesticides in all our golfing and, and camping operations. Uh, we, we, of course, have focused on energy efficiency and water efficiency and continue to do that. Uh, we're set, we've set up uh, recycling uh, systems and we're, we're getting into composting now. And in the future, we plan, uh, if, if we get the permission, to build an ecologically designed hotel. Next slide, please. On the site where we have the mobile home park now, this design is somewhat changed now. But the idea would be to set up a hotel that would do all the things that we would like to see done, like recycle water, uh, edible landscaping, orient the roofs so we can put solar cells on when they come out and are inexpensive enough to run the project. Uh, and uh, landscaping that integrates uh, both watershed function with habitat for animals and, and so forth. So all these are part of that, of that whole picture. And I, it sounds exciting because I hear from other people talking, and I'm sure I'll hear about more other projects that are out there that are, that are attempting to do this stuff. Uh, basically, and I think we're all in this, is, is if all costs are considered, there's no conflict between ecological sustainability and economic viability. The mechanism to, to have that come forward is true cost pricing or full cost pricing, some people call it that. And it's a great pr uh, pr uh, principle because it's a free market argument. The person who supposedly buys a product and benefits from it, they should pay all the costs associated with it. If I don't use toxic materials, why should I pay for the health uh, problems that are caused when other people do use them? And what it does is it levels the economic playing field so that people that have new ways of doing things can come to the marketplace and get the job done and, and, and uh, really have the economic edge. I mean, right now, what is ecologically sound is the most cost-effective thing to do, but it doesn't appear that way in the marketplace because all of us are actually subsidizing the very products and practices that are causing the problems. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, our next three speakers are uh, kind of focused on site as a big issue. I think Jim was too. Um, our first of the next three is Douglas Gardner from McGuire Thomas, who will briefly review the ways in which the Playa Vista project um, counterbalances the impact that um, it has on the Bologna wetlands. It's, uh, it's a controversial project and has wonderful innovations uh, for uh, sustainability. And uh, we're very pleased to welcome Douglas Gardner. Thank you, Polly. Uh, I'm the project manager for the Playa Vista project, which, as uh, John Picard mentioned, is uh, quite large and directly across the street. Uh, the site is the uh, former Howard Hughes uh, 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 aircraft manufacturing facility and was used for that purpose up until very recently. McGuire Thomas Partners, which is a major developer uh, in Los Angeles, took over this project four years ago, a little over four years ago. and. Uh, uh, took over a very troubled project. Hughes had spent uh, almost a dozen years trying to develop this property after the death of Howard Hughes. And uh, we were challenged at the outset to basically begin all over again with, with the uh, planning and zoning that had, that had uh, transpired to date in a manner more responsive to the regional and local issues that had surfaced relative to growth, uh, growth in the Los Angeles basin. Uh, we did so with our eyes open. It's a complicated process. It's a, it remains a complicated and complex project. Uh, we, uh, though, are committed to uh, trying to solve 
uh, this uh, problem, this project, uh, aware of the fact that growth is going to continue in the country and in the Los Angeles basin, and if we are going to uh, uh, survive as a region, we have to learn how to grow more effectively and more efficiently. I'm going to run through a very quick sequence of slides, and uh, uh, which will only give a taste for the for the project. Uh, uh, so, if I could have the first slide, uh, this is the project site. We're sitting over here about now. Uh, the project is about a thousand acres and it's bounded by the airport down here and a variety of, of neighborhoods and communities of varying uh, composition uh, and, as well as the Biona wetlands, uh, a very a badly degraded uh, natural habitat which forms about a quarter of our property. Next slide, please. The site lies in a very complex as well jurisdictional setting. There are four basic planning areas divided by Lincoln Boulevard and the Bayona Creek, Area A is in county jurisdiction, B, C, and D are in city of Los Angeles, A, B, and C are in the coastal zone, and all uh, precincts are subject to Corps of Engineers uh, uh, and all kinds of other uh, uh, federal and state guidelines I'll talk about in a second. Next slide, please. Uh, this is the existing zoning for the property. Uh, this was uh, zoning in place when we took over, which is a fairly conventional set of land use patterns, uh, mixed use, uh, office, uh, isolated uh, uh, components of residential. Uh, next slide, please. The planning team we put together, and it's a very broad team, uh, which includes uh, scientists, engineers, uh, uh, economists, uh, a whole array. The design team that I worked the most closely with consists of uh, Ricardo Lagareta, uh, Stefanos Polozoides, uh, uh, Buzz Udell, uh, uh, Lori Olin and, and the husband-wife team of Andreas Duani and Elizabeth Potter Zyberg. Next slide, please. The master plan that we have come up with, and I can only touch on this very briefly, basically in contrast to the slide you saw a few moments ago, proposes a more integrated set of land uses which attempts to integrate the basic uses of a community, uh, 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 residential, commercial, retail, recreational, civic, cultural, institutional, in a, a finer grain distribution within the site, at the same time preserving uh, over half of the site for habitat, uh, recreational open space, and uh, other uses which are basically non-development uses. Next slide, please. Uh, the basic elements of this plan, to run through them very quickly, um, improvements to the local, regional, uh, local and regional transportation systems. Next slide the application of an internal uh, street system which uh, attempts to provide the setting for a community which can function to the most advanced extent possible as a self-sufficient internally focused community. Next slide. The provision and identification of open space uh, within that framework, particularly as I mentioned, the restoration of the and expansion of the Biona wetlands and the provision of a 50-acre uh, riparian corridor and uh, a linear park, which performs multiple functions relative to recreation, stormwater management, and stormwater purification as part of a, an entire uh, water management system for the entire site. Next slide. Uh, we call this our uh, ecological infrastructure, which relates to transportation initiatives, uh, an internal low emission or non-polluting uh, op uh, privately operated shuttle system, bicycle paths, our own on-site wastewater treatment facility, organic recycling facility, and materials recycling facility. Next slide, please. All of this uh, then populated with a set of land uses which are intended again to provide uh, for the array of, of needs and services which we feel constitute any vital and, and, and viable community, a uh, mix of civic, uh, open space, uh, residential, retail, and commercial uses, uh, not uh, with any particular architectural vocabulary, which I hasten to add, particularly to this group. Uh, architectural issues as a matter of uh, style are not, uh, we feel, uh, what is critical about the design issues which face us here uh, at this particular stage of development. Uh, this is not a, a project at this point about style, it's about certain rules of an organization of urbanism. Next slide, please. 
Uh, we have tried to draw on what has worked from Southern California. We're not trying to import uh, examples of European communities or, or uh, uh, nostalgic images of, of other parts of the country, uh, basically beginning with the, the elements that have made Los Angeles work historically. Uh, street design. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Uh, details of street design, street width, curb radii, intended to provide a better pedestrian environment as an elemental uh, 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 part of, of a system intended to try to get people to, to depend less heavily on the automobile. Next slide. Uh, we have a first phase for this project, which is now uh, in the midst of an approvals process. This is a subdivision for an initial phase, which again, we're sitting right about here, so it's near Lincoln and Jefferson, and a portion of this uh, office development at the West End, which represents about 25% of the total development. Next slide, please. This is a model of the first phase, which indicates the West End development, which is primarily residential with appropriate civic, open space, local streets, a portion of the riparian corridor, and the freshwater marsh, which is the first uh, component of the restoration of the larger Biona wetland. Next slide, please. And we are uh, experimenting right now, and indeed just on the verge of getting into some, uh, I hope, very exciting issues, which have much to do with what you'll be talking about today regarding individual building design, in this case, uh, residential, uh, at uh, medium and higher densities, next slide, and lower densities, next slide, and commercial development as well, which attempts to pursue some of the same design principles we're pursuing elsewhere in the plan in terms of courtyard, garden, open space, next slide. This is an environmental impact report uh, on recycled paper, I will add, which is the uh, a, a topic which deserves uh, perhaps additional discussion that is now uh, has been circulated publicly as part of the first phase review. Next slide. Uh, what I'd like to do, if you could, could you just run through these next slides, maybe two seconds a slide. I won't say anything, but this is probably the issue I'd like to close with. This is, these are some of the groups we have to deal with in terms of approving a project of this sort. City, county, just keep going. There's quite a few of them. Regional, state of California, federal agencies. And these are the processes we have to go through. Tract maps, EIRs, uh, grading permits, all of these things. It's a complicated process. I'm aging rapidly, I have to tell you. What I'd like to close on with this, and again, that's a necessarily, uh, uh, perhaps, uh, not even worthwhile brief look at Playa Vista. It's certainly hard to capture the complexity of the project. Uh, my message, uh, fortunately, uh, has been in large part delivered by John Picard. Uh, we didn't rehearse, but the, the things John was alluding to really come up in that second batch of slides. My message is this. Uh, we have been pursuing, I think, with, with uh, as much diligence as possible a truly creative solution to, to growth in, in the LA Basin. Uh, it's not a perfect project, it has a long ways to go, and indeed there are many initiatives that I've already looked at in the next room that we, we need to begin thinking about, and people such as John Picard and, and others have, have, are going to be helping us in, in that regard. Uh, nothing that I showed there, though, in terms of innovation, whether it's streets, uh, treatment systems, wetland restoration, uh, nothing of this None of these are, are simple, and none of them are, are even in place in, in, in a lot of the jurisdictional settings. We're dealing with a lot of single agency, uh, single issue agencies who simply, by the definition of their function, are not necessarily trained or, or looking over broad spectrum of issues. Uh, my message to this group is we have been challenged to do what we can to make this a responsive development. Uh, indeed, it certainly, uh, we think we've made good progress. There's a long way to go. I, in turn, look to you, sitting on, on a different side of the table. I should have mentioned I was an architect for 13 years before I joined the development community. And if there's two things I've learned in this process, it's as follows. Patience and perseverance. That's point one. Point two is, of all the array of professionals and individuals, I can tell you that it's not the lawyers, it's not the financial people, I'm afraid it's not even the politicians who are going to make LA a better place. I think it's the design and the planning community who by nature, and I'm not talking about aesthetics, I'm talking about problem-solving abilities, who are the key to making this happen. And I can only echo what John said, please 
get involved, uh, get active. Uh, this group, I'm preaching to the choir, I know, but everything we can do to help create the regulatory framework to help the development community pursue these ideas, I think is going to be critical to the future, uh, to the success of, of these initiatives and to the future of this region. Thanks. We thought it'd be interesting to just oppose that project with one of a considerably different size. Scott McGillivray, an architect here in LA, will discuss a private residence in which uh, there's an attempt to also incorporate a great deal of innovative, environmentally sound ideas. Thanks, Polly. Um, I just uh, got back last night from attending the 93 Solar Energy Forum in Washington, D.C. Uh, it's the first time I've really attended that event and sort of followed the magazines and so forth over the years. But I was very encouraged uh, to find it was a, a group of architects, mechanical engineers, scientists, manufacturers, and utility companies uh, and uh, local government groups that were there attending, looking at uh, what other, other people were doing, telling what they were doing, and uh, there was a very uh, positive outlook uh, at the new administration, and uh, there were some very uh, uh, biting feelings about uh, what had happened and what had been uh, unfunded in the last uh, 12 years. Uh, but uh, that gave me a new uh, vigor to uh, look back at my projects where I thought perhaps I'd done a lot of interesting things and uh, I really realized that there was a, a lot of things that I could do. And uh, one thing struck me when I flew back into LA, it was uh, dusk, the uh, sun was still up a little bit and I'm looking down and uh, start looking around the LA basin and you can tell where the poor areas are and where the wealthy areas are in town by how much foliage there is. And uh, it's not necessarily a density issue, sometimes it is, but uh, there's no reason why uh, the large areas of Los Angeles have so little foliage. Uh, I know we had a drought and I know uh, we're conserving water, uh, but those are solvable issues. And uh, in LA itself, we have the potential to export electricity. Uh, we don't have to have power plants. Uh, when life cycle costing is placed in comparatively to photovoltaics and uh, the nuclear power plants that have been built, uh, it's more affordable for us to generate our own electricity by PV. Uh, it's also possible for us to export produce. Uh, we don't have to import produce. We have all the capabilities to export it and uh, these are things that could uh, provide great benefits uh, to uh, the poorer areas as we're trying to rebuild them. What I see our job is as architects is to make more out of less. Uh, and we do that in many ways and uh, we are supposed to be clever, we're supposed to show our clients that uh, they can have their cake and eat it too. Uh, and all of that really applies towards our energy usage uh, and our land use developments. Um, the projects I'm going to show you, one uh, in particular I'll focus on, but they uh, are just some uh, small examples of uh, ways to look at uh, getting more for less. And I'm going to take uh, grading and mechanical systems in particular because uh, we're not, uh, other speakers are not talking about them uh, too much. If we could get the first slide. Uh, this is a project uh, in uh, Granada Hills. Uh, this was the, uh, the very large 150-person uh, 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 civil engineering firm that produced uh, a series of little tiered pads on top of the hill and 
it's a downslope uh, property, all of that heavy shaded area are graded slopes, bench drains, and uh, huge retaining walls. Uh, so, next slide, please. Uh, excuse me, next slide, please. Uh, this is uh, a regrading study uh, that I did for the client. Uh, it's hard to get in great detail here, but uh, what I've tried to do is introduce landform contouring. We eliminated all the bench drains. We saved them 250 grand in retaining walls, and we also increased their lots from eight lots of 10,000 square feet each to 13 lots with uh, 16,000 square foot each, and we saved them money. And uh, that was just a matter of making uh, more out of less, trying to provide a more attractive environment. And part of that was doing by sloping the lots. We don't have to have flat pads. Uh, it was a method of uh, uh, thinking about the design of the buildings and some step-down uh, uh, interiors that would uh, open up the views and take advantage of the site and absorb some of the grading and create a much more interesting environment. Uh, next slide. Uh, this uh, is perhaps a little bit difficult to see, but this was uh, a single residence site. Uh, it's a little box canyon. Uh, it was graded by a previous developer, and uh, my client uh, went out and looked at this, and they said, wow, look at all. You could see 10 acres of property, and he owned half of it. And uh, uh, because of the way the grading was done, you, you couldn't build uh, a... Uh, much of a house on the property, uh, let alone have some of the amenities that he wanted. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, in uh, not wanting to tell him to go back and sell his property and look for another one, uh, we came up with a plan where we fixed the grading scars on the site and we imported dirt, uh, which was destined for the uh, Potrero Canyon dump on PCH and uh, that had a great benefit for us because people actually paid money to bring their dirt to us to fix our land scars. And so we took uh, that property, next slide please, uh, and tried to integrate tennis court, which I usually see as a scar on the land, and so we tried to bury this court uh, to where uh, it is only has uh, a 36 inch fence above grade uh, with uh, some bushes in some place and open for viewing in other places where uh, you can uh, not be confronted with this massive uh, tennis court. Next. The uh, uh, next slide, we'll just continue uh, to move along quickly. The, uh, in, in filling with no cutting, uh, we ended up with some smooth transitions, uh, as can be seen here, between what was the natural slope and what was the uh, buildable area. Next. Uh, these are some of the hills. Uh, they're beautiful rock outcroppings and so forth. Next. Uh, we tried to eliminate all cutting. Uh, and uh, we also absorbed, next, 15 feet of grade uh, from the back to the front of the property. Uh, to give us a more interesting uh, uh, contour on the property. Uh, we saved the rocks from the site to uh, use it uh, to uh, create uh, an, a little catchment area, a natural catchment area where the water goes into underground drainage systems and then goes to an underground cistern for irrigating uh, the landscape. Next. The, uh, actually, this is a PV system, uh, which is uh, used for the, uh, uh, powering the uh, job site uh, during construction and uh, is integrated into the uh, uh, finished residence uh, afterwards. There was a great payback on this system uh, because of the cost of bringing temporary electricity into the project. Next. Um, what uh, we've basically done uh, with our water, we've got a 10-acre watershed. Uh, we have uh, captured the water in seven canyons as it descends upon the site. Uh, we've taken all of that underground. 
instead of having the traditional concrete trench that wraps around a property and creates a barrier between you and the natural hillside. Uh, this uh, makes a much more attractive development. It is also given us storage facility uh, where we save the rainwater, we use it for irrigation, and we provide between 30 and 50 percent of the irrigation needs of the site with that. When you tie that in with a uh, gray water system, which this house will have, uh, then uh, we've really got a tremendous payback. Uh, we use low uh, water, usage, water usage planting, and, uh, and we're uh, uh, we're really kind of helping solve everything at once. Uh, they can have their landscape, they can enjoy their large site, uh, and they can be an example of uh, conservation at the same time. Next. Uh, next. Uh, these are just other views of the site. Next. Uh, we had to widen the driveway uh, to meet the fire department requirements. Uh, why they have to have a 20-foot wide paved roadway to get into the property is a little bit difficult to understand sometimes, but uh, uh, they're insurmountable. Uh, this is, uh, so we have used some crib walls where we could uh, because of their low uh, visual impact on the site. Uh, this hasn't even been planted at this point, but the uh, just natural seeds in the soil have begun to uh, pop up. Next. Uh, this uh, shows that uh, uh, subterranean, not really subterranean, but it's a buried uh, tennis court. Uh, next. Um, the uh, next. Uh, the house is uh, fairly traditional looking. Uh, we've been focusing on low toxic building materials. Uh, we have uh, uh, tried to provide uh, shading uh, with large overhangs. We've got dormer windows bringing in high light. In the center of the house, there's a three-story space. We create a thermal chimney. Air evacuates uh, through the top. Uh, we've got uh, covered porches next. On the uh, western side, where the major views were, uh, we didn't want to uh, eliminate glazing, which you really should try to do on the west sides. But we've got uh, uh, large overhangs. We've got big covered porches. And uh, we're also uh, next. Okay. Um, uh, these, why don't you just run through the rest of the slides. Uh, just other houses using similar features, but uh, might not have been uh, uh, a traditional look. I don't think that uh, is really a factor whether you look high tech or not. Uh, the, uh, we've uh, been using a cooling system which we used on a sports stadium and the, uh, uh, it's to use fog for cooling. And uh, the uh, fog system, we've applied this to the house where you can create your own direct evaporative cooler with the me fogging system and uh, create space that is air conditioned at uh, less than a 20th of the cost of regular air conditioning. In fact, it was used in Seville to air condition outdoor spaces. Uh, and I will close with that. Thank you very much. I'm sure Scott will have a lot of questions this afternoon. Uh, our next speaker is Robert Cornell. He's a landscape architect and uh, well known for his water conservation demonstration garden at the LA Arboretum and the founder of the Greater LA Green Industry Council. Thank you, Polly. I'd like to correct a few things. I'm actually a landscape designer contractor. I'm a designer who has dirt under his fingernails and has been out in the trenches doing water conserving and environmentally appropriate landscaping for over the last 10 years. I made a commitment about 10 years ago, seeing the, the picture that we were outrunning our resources, and I am here today to state that you can do this kind of work and survive and even prosper. 
about three years ago, I'm, I joined with other people in the landscape industry to put together the Greater Los Angeles Green Industry Council, which is an umbrella group of all the professions and businesses within the landscaping industry to deal in a proactive way with environmental issues. In point of fact, the Los Angeles Landscape Ordinance, which is still wending its way through the bowels of the bureaucracy of the city. And I would like to underline what uh, John Picard says, we all need to get active. Uh, in fact, there is an opportunity for the AIA to be working now with the Greater Los Angeles Green Industry Council on the city's efforts to develop a stormwater runoff reduction act similar to what's been done in Santa Monica, but I'm afraid that the Santa Monica one may not be very practical. And if we are going to make an impact, we have to be able to get in early in a non-adversarial way and become part of the solution, not part of the problem. Uh, with that little political thing, I'd like to segue into uh, what I do and give you some uh, of my uh, views from a landscaping standpoint. Slides, please. Traditionally, landscaping has been seen as window dressing. First slide. This is David Hockney's residence uh, up on Mulholland. This is kind of a caricature, caricature of what I'm talking about, but basically in residential work, I would say especially the building architect builds the building, then he turns it over to the client and says, find yourself a landscape design person and shrub it up. Uh, I agree totally with what John Picard said if you're going to do environmental design, you should be involved much earlier in the game. And I hope that I can give, convince you architects to involve people like myself early in the process. This will, not, this will not complicate your job. It'll actually make it easier for you and get you in less problems. And I'll show you a few of the problems as we go along. Next slide, please. This is typical of uh, urban spec development. The developers on this project told me, shrub it up, green it up, color it up, we want to sell it. But what they didn't know is they got xeriscaping, they got water conservation, they were wonderfully happy with the project and didn't even know that it was xeriscaping. So I have found that you can seduce people into these kinds of, of projects just by the beauty of the material. Next slide, please. Here's a typical example of what can happen when you're not involved early on. Uh, architects uh, Peter Wurzberger developed this. He and his wife are a very wonderful uh, developing design developer team. They built this on spec, then loved the house so much that they moved into it. But the issue is that when they, grading, when they graded the front of the property, they neglected to leave me any soil. So the area up by the house was, was bedrock. Fortunately, it was sandstone. We pickaxed it out and created a subsoil and used pioneer planting materials to landscape it. And fortunately, those materials are tough enough that the end product turned out looking very nice and low maintenance. But I would not suggest to you that this is the way to go. Next slide, please. Sustainable landscaping requires a more holistic approach. We need to look at preservation and resource conservation on a longer term basis and develop a cooperation between the hardscape and the softscape designers earlier on in, in the process. And if we do that, next slide, we can have wonderful projects like this. This won the top residential award in Los Angeles this year. Next slide, please. This is xeriscaping and it shows that it can be mainstream and sell itself just on its looks alone and still be very environmentally appropriate. Next slide, please. And finally, next slide. Next slide. One of the things that we're dealing with is, thermo is the laws of thermodynamics. The laws of thermodynamics state that if a the further a system is out of equilibrium, from its stable energy base, provided there's not an energy barrier where you have a substable area. If there's no energy barrier, that system will try to go to its lowest energy state. The further you get it out of that energy state, the more energy you have to put into that system to maintain it. Our landscapes have been highly out of equilibrium with our, with our local environment. This is a garden, it's actually my home garden, which has a great deal of biodiversity and plant material that is appropriate to our climate. 
This requires very little water input. I have never used pesticides. I do very little maintenance on this project. And yet it has a wonderful flower color year round. Next I would like to go into some specific issues. I'd like to talk about trees for a while because this is one of the areas where architects and landscape design professionals should interface very carefully. Next slide, please. Uh, I'd like to talk somewhat about solar shading. We all know that, that trees uh, can shade a structure and provide solar shading. I think that we need to get into more detail on this very soon, though, and here's some of the things I think we need to think about. We need to look at the size of the tree. We need to look at the density of the tree. If you're wanting to use ventilation as a factor in your cooling, you may find that if you're not using the appropriate trees, the canopy of the tree may be too dense or low. You may be blocking some of the ventilation that you want to have on the house. Also, I think it's very important for the building architect to tell the landscape person what his intent is on, on sol use of solar energy so that you can be very careful that in the long term, the trees will not overgrow their site and cause problems for the, the solar panels. I see all too often projects are designed with way too many trees and the inappropriate trees. Uh, the coral tree being a prime example of that. I have at my booth today, just to encourage you to come over and, and meet with me at lunchtime or, or later in the, the afternoon, a list of shade trees, which are appropriate for shading with different heights and geometries. And I would um, welcome you to have that with the proviso that you not try to do my job. But just to give you an example of the type of material that is available there, out there and is unfortunately very poorly utilized. We have far too many, far too little diversity in the landscapes that are, are generated. Uh, next slide, please. I'm sorry, would you go back to that for a minute? Uh, back to the, the slide before this. All right, this is just an example of solar shading. These are Choricea speciosus, Brazilian silk floss tree. I chose these because they are fairly open and airy and will not deter the architectural line. I know you architects like to have your buildings out there, and so I didn't want to screen this too much. I can see my time is running up, so I'm going to move quickly. Go ahead, next slide. Uh, some possibilities. You can also use vines for screening to get early uh, shading on, on structures uh, without the use of expensive specimen trees. Next slide. Some basics of tree preservation. It's hard to see this. This is a project where we had an existing sycamore. The architect uh, plans were to bury it about four feet. That wasn't such a good idea. We proposed a bridge instead and lowered the, the grading to expose the root structure better. Next slide. Next slide. Put in an expensive aeration system. Next slide. Next slide. And there's the finished product. It would have been far better if we could have been earlier in the project and negotiated uh, that tree. Maybe we could have changed the grade with the split level house. Uh, also, using piles and grade beams to arch over existing root systems. One thing I'd like to get across to you with trees is the structure of a tree is that the the active feeder roots are at the periphery of the tree's umbrella of leaves. That's where the active roots are. Somehow we think that if we protect up around five feet around the trunk of the tree, we're going to save that tree. Well, if we have heavy machinery running over the root zone of the tree, that ain't necessarily so. So we need to learn to protect the whole, what's called the drip line of the tree. And the landscape ordinance, which is proposed, would propose to go five feet out of that, and that if you did any kind of grading or construction within that, the city would consider that you've killed that tree. Uh, I guess my time is running up here. Water conservation, let's rapidly go. This is the same project. Uh, water conservation is not a one-shot deal. There is no silver bullet out there that will do it all for you. Drought-tolerant plants, drip irrigation, gray water use, these are all parts of the picture, but it's very important that we design holistically, analyzing sites in terms of solar exposure, wind exposure, soil type, topography, and design our plant groupings to maximize the effect of those microclimates. Do our irrigation systems that will service those plant groupings and use the, the design uh, principle of form following function to maximize our landscapes. Thank you very much.
I suggest you go to his booth and try to get all his trade secrets. Uh, our next three speakers are going to talk to us about our three favorite building materials, steel, concrete, and wood. So uh, first, John Picard will talk about steel briefly. Thanks. I'm going to make this real brief, but um, I guess we're starting to get an indication as to uh, how things could be done. And the thing that I've been finding most recently, having worked with some materials that have failed me, is that the more often I look back towards trying to mimic nature, the cheaper I'm finding that my projects are getting to. So I'm coming to this realization that mimicking nature is a lot cheaper than fighting it. And I think the things that Bob was working on and the things that Jim was alluding to and, and I'm sure the other products displays we're going to talk about. Steel's controversial. People think of steel as Bethlehem plants in the East Coast pumping and, and belching pollutants into the air. Well, you should because they are doing that in many places. And in many places there are sophisticated electric arc ovens that are producing steel, not producing it because we're concerned or they're concerned about the environment, but they're trying to bring the price per ton of steel down. And in the world, there's really only two types of steel, and both of them have recycled content. You know, pure ore blast furnace type steel is about 30% recycled. And the only reason it's got that content of recyclability in it is because they inject an oxygen lance in at the last moment, and they have to add scrap material in it to keep the thing from blowing up. So it's kind of the chemistry that forces that recycled content. The other is where they just load a room full of recycled steel and throw a current to it and melt it down. Now, shipping it off of San Pedro onto a, a super tanker and bringing it to Japan or Brazil and processing it and then cold rolling it and bringing it back here is not the way it should be. The way it should be is we should have a scrap facility in South Central, we should have a plant, a smelting plant or some type of an electric arc plant here in LA and we should produce big bar steel and roll it and produce the material right here from scrap that's produced here and that's that that's a true recycle closed loop I I didn't know that my steel was recycled and so I was really uh, amazed because I, I just didn't want to contribute to this mechanized world where we go down and cut a 200 year old old growth forest with a chainsaw in 10 minutes because I know nothing's going to replace that tree except another 200 years. And when you get to, to double digit or single digit percentages of materials, you got to take a step back and say, whoa, and you got to look for things that maybe at this moment might not be the best, but they have possibilities for improvement. And I think there's, I know the scientific certification fellows are involved in a, in a research, if I'm not mistaken, I've been reading this anyway, that they're looking at the, the cradle to grave and the cradle to cradle, cradle to cradle of steel versus wood. And I haven't heard anything on the street, but I can tell you from my experience that I had one container leave my job site. It was one container because half the container was filled with my contractor's roofing discards from another project. Every Friday, a guy came by in a little pickup truck and picked up the scrap metal off my site. Every day, people handled the material as though it was more valuable than dimensional lumber, where in fact it wasn't. My job cost the same to build in steel as it does to build with wood. The mistake was made in the learning curve at the point of framing. I worked with an engineer who had been engineering wood projects and not steel projects. Mistake number one. Mistake number two was I never engaged a framing contractor that had any more experience than just basic TI work in high rises. Mistake number three was I let all that happen without really checking in with anybody that had done a house prior working with steel. I blindless, blindly saw a car wash being built in steel and I said, you know, I'm just not going to do this with trees and I'm going to maybe do it with block and maybe do it with this. Well, now there's all kinds of alternates and, you know, steel's just one of them. But because my house is steel and I overbuilt it and it's the battleship that it is and it's termite proof and all that kind of stuff and it's got seismic rating, well that's all great, but I still, if you look very carefully and I'm on the learning curve just like you are, I probably, you know, wasted more energy over designing and over building. And you need to utilize these net shaped material efficiencies. We need to maximize this, this 10 to 1 weight ratio to strength that, that, that this material has. These are the kind of hidden things that we need to ha look at. 
Why doesn't Bank of America give me 60-year mortgage or 50-year mortgage? Because my steel frame house should last that long, if not longer. My insurance is a third off. When I finish building my house, I, I don't know who the company is. It's one of the big companies. My insurance quotes were like $1,280 for the year, including some earthquake insurance. So I got on the phone. I told my secretary, tell them it's built out of steel. And they said, well, so what? Nothing happened. And I got on the phone with them myself. And I said, send someone out, or I'm not going to be your customer. So they sent a guy out. And about an hour and a half later, he gets through walking through the house, and he leaves. And, and I got a, a, a discount on my insurance down to $744 a year for the same and like kind policy. Working on a 180-unit project in Westminster with the city of Westminster and a big developer. It's, a, it's a, a retirement home. And the building was framed and originally engineered in wood. And it was a four-story building. It's on a pretty tight lot configuration. And I looked at the drawings, and I couldn't believe the foundation system. They had to dig out eight feet and recompact. They had the most sophisticated bearing, I mean, uh, grade beams and caissons I'd ever seen since I'd worked on Marvin Davis's house on a hillside where we put 250 20-foot caissons in. And I thought, this job's costing more underground than it does above ground. And the developer said, I'm running out of His problem was he lost 8% of his first floor square footage because of the density of the dimensional lumber that had to support the next three floors. Well, at the end of the day, the materials were cheaper with steel, the engineering was 10 times as much, the building ended up weighing a whole bunch less, like a Bucky Fuller view on things. How efficient is the building? How much does it weigh? Have you ever looked at that? Have you ever look at the long-term costs, the long-term operating costs, the long-term view of the whole project? And then things started to shake out. All the exterior walls became bearing walls. We started to see full dimensions. We started to see reductions in drywall costs. We saw reductions in installation costs for electrical and plumbing. We saw a much more sophisticated placement of the mechanical equipment, a smarter project, where we thought through the foundations combined with the wall systems. And then the big one hit, which was a $260,000 reduction in the foundation and the grading which paid for and bonus the thing beyond. Now, this is very site-specific. This isn't going to happen everywhere. This isn't going to happen all the time. But those kinds of things are out there. The, the, the negative aspects of the materials supply in terms of steel is that a lot of it's not produced here. And, and I'm trying to change that. And you should, too. We, we can reshape the market by asking that. One of the simplest things you can do when you're thinking about buying steel is ask for recycled content. It's that simple. Whether you go to Angeles Metals or whether you go to anybody else, you tell them what percentage of recycled material you want in a project. And you ask them to give you a, 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 a kind of an objective view of where the materials come from and, and where it's been transported from. And again, work with engineers that have had experience with this. You're going to see grid-type frames. You're not going to see stick-built structures. You're going to see things go up in a fraction of the time. Keep in mind, the engineering is critical. This is a project where things are keyed to one piece tying into another. It's, you can't get away with the things you can get away with stick-built dimensional type buildings because they, everything relies on everything else in these designs. And that's the kind of computer, that's the world of digitizing and computer accuracy that's coming down too. It's going to make metal even better. And the industry as a whole is focused on capturing the market now. Most people are moving to steel because wood's gone up 90%. In my opinion, wood should double even from where it is now because no one's ever paid the true price for a piece of old growth. So come check out my house. Check out the mistakes. That's, it's, it's moving that way. I spoke to 400 builders in Dallas. I think it was yesterday or the day before. I've been bopping around. But these guys were jumping at the opportunity to keep themselves in business. And so you're going to see steel come onto the market, not because of the environmental shift, but because lumber's gone up. So check it out. Thanks.